Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job. Uh, we're going to begin with chapter 32 tonight. If you have not seen the previous studies on Job, the first 31 chapters are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. <clears throat> So before we get started, let me ask our brother Eric and brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, Dahomo. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Okay, back to you. Hey, brothers and sisters, and everybody out there, it's brother Stephen. You know, known here on YouTube as Stephen Rivers TV, and you know it's awesome to be here tonight to you know fellowship and learn tonight. Okay, um, without further ado, we'll begin uh, Job chapter 32, verse 1 in the KJV. Uh, I like to read the KJV first, and then after that we'll probably look at it in the Amplified. It might be helpful. Let's, uh, i tell you what, after I read this, instead of telling you the title that the Amplified put on this chapter, I'll ask you to give a title uh, so to see if you you come up with a title that's like uh, like the one in the Amplified. <clears throat> Brother Eric wanted to do that last time and I spoiled the fun so here goes I'll read the whole chapter 32 in the KJV. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu the son of Barkel, uh, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. Uh, when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Day, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. <clears throat> but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore I said, hearken to me, I also will show mine opinion. Behold, I waited for your words, I gave ear to your reasons, whilst ye searched out what to say. Yea, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job, or that answered his words, lest ye should say, we have found out wisdom, God thrusteth him down, not man. Now he hath not directed his words against me, neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed, they answered no more, they left off speaking. When I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more, I said, I will answer also my part, I also will show mine opinion, for I am full of matter, the spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will, I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. Okay, so that's uh, Elihu finally decided to speak. What did, uh, what would you, how would you title that chapter? I would title that, oh shit. <laughs> okay, forgive me, Brother Luke, but it sounds like somebody's in deep caca. Uh, I certainly hope we don't, uh, we aren't allowed to make any doctrines out of this uh, chapter. Okay, back to you guys. 
Well, um, I guess I ain't going to be anywhere near close to this, but, I mean, I guess what just sticks to me is just how it says, like, the wrath is just kindled. So it just looks like it's just... Mm. Almost looks like just rage. Like, Elihu's rage to an extent, maybe. I'm not exactly sure. Well, the uh, the title, the Amplified, gives for this chapter is Elihu Rebukes Job. And I don't think, uh, maybe after I go through the the same chapter in the Amplified, I'll, I might agree with that title. But my first impression is uh, there's really no rebuke of Job. Maybe in the next chapter, Elihu continues on with his with a rebuke. But it seems to me at this point, Elihu is actually rebuking the other th the th three friends for their failure at convincing Job that his troubles are deserved. Uh, Elihu is saying that they've gone on and on arguing with Job, and Job's won the argument. And uh, now he's all disgusted. He's enraged because they, these older, wiser men, were not able to uh, prove to Job that Job deserves these punishments. Uh, so that's how I reacted to that chapter in the KJV. I'll go through it slowly in the Amplified, but first let me get your reaction to that. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I'm anxious to see what we come up with. Okay, go ahead. All right, well... I mean, looking at this, I guess I'll have a lot more to say when we're going, you know, verse by verse through this, but I think it's just him, I guess it is what mostly stands out is just how he's saying that he's like kindling his wrath and how it's going at, you know, at these three men, you know, at least for the summary part, but I think it's just mostly the wrath that sticks out for now, but I guess we'll elaborate more, you know, more as we go through each individual verse. Yeah, we, we will go through it more slowly, but my my summary, did you feel that that was, did you get the same impression as I stated in my summary or not? Oh, that he was just going for the uh, three men? Well, I'm not going to repeat the summary again. Uh, you, you either thought it, it was uh, correct or not. Do you have an opinion? Well, I mean... I mean, that's just what I remember. And so, like, I didn't really see him talk really that much against Job. I saw him mostly just talking to the three men. So if that's the case, I'd have to agree with that. All right. Let me go on then. I'll read it now in the Amplified. It says, verse, uh, chapter 32, verse 1 in Amplified, uh, it says, So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes and could not be persuaded otherwise by them. But Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, became indignant. His indignation was kindled and burned, and he became upset with Job because he justified himself rather than God, and even expressed doubts about God's character. Elihu's anger burned against Job's three friends because they had, not, they had found no answer and were unable to determine Job's error. And yet they had condemned Job and declared him to be in the wrong and responsible for his own afflictions. Now Elihu had, awaited a, had waited to speak to Job because the others were years older than he. And, and when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouths of these three men, he burned with anger. I'll stop there. That's the first five verses and get your reaction to that. Uh, well, yeah, he's very upset, Brother Luke. Uh, so that uh, makes me wonder uh, what's going to happen next. Okay. Hmm. Well, I mean, besides the fact that he got angry, it's just, I guess what I'm looking so at right now is, I don't know, I guess the words that jump out to me in, you know, verse 1 would have to be how it says he was righteous in, you know, his own eyes. 
I don't know if like that pops out to you, but for some reason that just pops out how it says his own. But, I mean, we did see his account last chapter. But looking back at um, verse 3, just saying, you know, this is all like, you know, it's like them all against Job, but it's just, I guess, seeing him, you know, burn out at those guys, you know, because they had condemned Job, but yet they didn't have an answer at the same time. It's just, hmm. all right, I guess I don't have too much more to say as of right this second. All right. Well, when we go back through the last, you know, 10, 15 chapters, uh, you know, it's an ongoing argument between Job's three friends. Uh, they're called friends, but to me, I keep saying I, I don't think they're really friends. Um, if that's what a friend is, you know, I, I, I don't want one because all they're doing is they're not trying to help him or encourage him or uh, console him. Uh, all they're doing is condemning him, pointing the finger, accusing him. Uh, and so for chapter after chapter, they tell Job how terrible he is, and, and that's why he's, he's suffering. From, and, and Job then in a chapter or two gives his answer in his defense, and, and Job's answer is, no, I, it's not because I'm wicked. It's because I'm good. I, I am good. I don't deserve this. So, Job is, uh, how is it stated there that you said, uh, it says, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Uh, Job, and Job, Job looks in the mirror, and he sees a righteous man. And it, isn't it true? Didn't we already conclude that Job was innocent? And, and uh, we know that Job is not afflicted by God. He's afflicted by Satan. We know that the affliction is not a result of his sin and wickedness, as his so-called friends are, are claiming. His affliction is uh, he's because he's righteous, and and Satan and, and God both know he's know he's righteous. But Satan's trying to get him to curse God and say uh, if he's afflicting him to the point and says, if you let me afflict him enough, he'll curse you. And so that's that's what's going on. So uh, I think that uh, Elihu here is um, just like the other two, the, um, just like all, all everybody in the story. Nobody knows what's going on except for Brother Eric, uh, Brother Stephen, and Brother Luke. We know what's going on because we read the whole book of Job. We read the first two chapters. We know the truth of what was really happening. But the other characters don't know. Not even Job understands what's going on. Uh, so let me move on. Brother Luke, I have a question. What would happen if Job did curse God? I I don't know how to answer that. I'm I'm not a, an authority to answer that. Um, let me go on, unless uh, Stephen wants to answer your question. Well, I mean, I don't think I can really answer that either. I mean, I guess really all I can say is the only way we would have known is if it happened. I guess that's pretty much all I could say as of right now. Oh, boy. I think I can answer that question, guys. Okay. Here we go. It's very simple. He would have broken the old covenant. But now under the new covenant that won't break the new covenant what do you think would it break the new covenant brother Luke well if you curse God right now are you gonna to go to hell okay uh, it's not necessary for me to answer that right uh, we can assume that's your answer and we know what the answer is yeah okay yeah, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing that we can do to change our our uh, standing with God as a child. We're a, a justified child of God. There's nothing we can do. We can get angry with God. We can curse Him. We can turn our back on Him. We can get into sin. We can do all these bad things, and our standing cannot be 
changed. We're born again, child of God. Now, if we do those bad things, though, uh, bad things can, could result from it because of the law of reaping and sowing and also because of God's chastisement. I'm going to go on now. <clears throat> Uh, verse 6 in the Amplified, Then Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, said, I am young, and you are aged. He's referring to the three guys, remember, not Job, because Job is not as old as the other guys. For I am young, and you are aged. For that reason I was anxious and dared not to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak, and a multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a vital force and a spirit of intelligence in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. Those who are abundant in years may not always be wise, nor, nor may the elders always understand justice. Therefore, I say, listen to me. I also will give you my opinion about Job's situation and tell you plainly what I think. I'll, I'll stop there after verse 10. Let you respond to that. Well, I was a little concerned with verse nine. Uh, seems to me that uh, I found a loophole uh, in the law for all the great men and the aged uh, who will get themselves in hot water. Okay, well, all right, that was a long pause, but, well, just looking back at this, how he said he just, he originally doesn't want to give his opinion, but, you know, saying how, like, they were older and, you know, you know, wiser, you know, as he said, they should speak in a multitude of years to teach wisdom, but then it's like he just turns it completely around in verse 9 and just whacks them, you know, verbally is pretty much what I see. He just goes from just like saying something respectful to just then turning around and just throwing a punch. That's all I can say. And then he's like, all right, so I guess I'm going to show my opinion now. All right. Now, what Elihu has done, uh, I, I, I'll only give you my answer instead of asking for yours. It doesn't seem to me like he's done, Elihu's done anything wrong at this point. He's, he's saying... I've tried to show you respect. Respect my elders. Now that's something that, you know, uh, he should have done. And that's something even today that we should do. We should respect our elders. And people would think that as you get older and gray, that you gain wisdom. But as we've said in our studies of the book of Proverbs, it's not always the case, unfortunately. Sometimes people grow older and they don't gain wisdom. They end up being, staying, staying stupid and foolish. Um, and so that's, that's basically his conclusion. He says, I, I respected you. I let you speak because you're elders. And, and I thought you'd be wise, but you, you haven't been able to come up with a good answer here. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and be bold. Even though I'm younger, I'm going to speak and give you my opinion because I think you failed. Okay, I'll go on unless you want to respond to that. Oh, that's very great. So now, that makes it even more interesting. Okay, I'm anxious to see what he's got to say. Mm. Yeah, that comment makes sense, what you said. Mm. Maybe I was just thinking about... Eh. Maybe I just misinterpreted it slightly. Eh. All right, let me let me go on then here. Uh, verse starting with verse eleven. Elihu is continuing. He says, "You see, I waited for your words. I listened to uh, to your wise reasons, while you pondered and searched out what to say. I even paid close attention to what you said. Indeed, not one of you convinced Job, nor could you refute him." Not one of you supplied satisfactory answers to his words. 
Beware, if you say we have found wisdom, God thrusts Job down justly, not, not man, for God alone is dealing with him. Now Job has directed his words against me, therefore I have no reason to be offended, nor will I answer him with arguments like yours. I speak for truth, not for revenge. Uh, I'll stop right there. Uh, and before I go on, that's uh, end of verse 14. Um, okay. Why are you stopping there? <laughs> I thought you might want to say something about that. Stephen, do you want to say something? Yeah, I guess... I guess, you know, looking at 11 through, um, I guess so, so far, just, I guess, the continuation of what, someone, were you laughing? Oh, never mind. All right. But I guess, like, looking at, like, you know, the majority of this, it was, I guess, just a continuation of what he was saying, you know, earlier about, you know, yielding to them. But then it gets out, you know, that, you know, they couldn't do their job in the argument. You know, this is what he's saying. And then it gets to, you know, you know, God, you know, thrusteth him down, you know, not man. That's what, you know, it's gotten to. Oh, that's what they said. Yeah, and now it's just like, you know what, I'm just going to stop here for right this second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we don't know what Elihu's uh, answer is going to be yet. He's setting up his answer in this chapter. I think in the next chapter we'll get more details of what his, what his interpretation of the situation is. But for now he's just saying, I've listened patiently and I'm really disappointed. You guys are older. I thought you'd be wiser uh, and uh, you haven't been able to refute Job. You, you're just accusing him and saying God is responsible for doing this to him and, rather than man. And uh, I'm disappointed and you know, I thought you were wise. He's kind of being sarcastic, implying that they're <laughs> They're not really very wise. He's not impressed. Now let me go on. Verse, um, verse 15. They, Job's friends, are dismayed and embarrassed. They no longer answer. The words have moved away and failed them, says Elihu. And shall I wait because they say nothing, but stand still and say no more? I too will give my share of answers. I too will express my opinion and share my knowledge. For I am full of words, and the spirit within me constrains me. My belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins. It is about to burst. It, I must speak so that I may get relief. I will open my lips and answer. I will, I will not, I warn you, be partial to any man. That is, let my respect for you mitigate what I say, nor flatter any man. For I do not know how to flatter in an appropriate way, and I fear that my maker would soon take me. Well, I kind of like this guy. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, looking at you know this part, well, I mean, obviously those guys are going to be, the three friends are going to be stunned, as it says they are, you know, here. And now he's, you know, presenting that, you know, I'm now going to give, you know, my full, unbiased, you know, and true opinion, you know, and not, you know, hold, you know, anything back. I'm just going to say the truth. But I don't know. One thing that just stood out to me was, even though I, it might not be a direct, even though it's really, I guess, not a direct relationship, but I just remember seeing the, you know, the wineskin section. And it just reminds me of, you know, what Jesus said about, you know, like old wine being poured into new wine skins. No, no, sorry. New wine being poured into like old wine skins and stuff like that. I don't know. I just remember like – I'm just saying I just remember that matching up to stuff that you just said in the future. But even though I'm not seeing really that much of a connection right here. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I thought of that, the wine skin, uh, Jesus' words about uh, as I read that too. I've talked about that. Uh, numerous times, in the, in the, I think in the book of Proverbs, because some people uh, think that uh, drinking alcoholic beverages uh, is uh, sinful and horrible, and Christians must abstain from alcoholic beverages. 
and they even go so far as to say that the the wine that we read about uh, Jesus and everybody around him drinking was was just grape juice. It wasn't real alcoholic wine. Um, so that the the, the the story about the wine skin bursting and uh, that's proof that it was alcoholic wine. It was not grape juice. Um, I guess that I better explain why since uh, since we're on it now. But uh, when you put grape juice into the wine skin, you you let it wait and and it it ferments and gas builds up within the wine skin and the wine skin stretches out and then uh, it stretches to a certain point and it and it won't doesn't burst so they've learned how to put enough wine in it so that it'll stretch but not burst but Jesus says if you put new wine which is unfermented wine into an old wine skin it'll burst and it, it'll all be lost because the new the new wine uh, will ferment and it stretches out the wineskin but since the wineskin has already been stretched to its capacity because it's a used wineskin it has no more elasticity left in it and the new wine causes the old wineskin to stretch beyond its ability and it bursts and the, everything's lost and of course Jesus was talking about mixing the New Testament with the Old Testament we don't do that we do not mix uh, you know uh, uh, that we're saved by the grace of God through faith alone and Christ alone and try to mix that with Judaism. That's something we've talked about a lot too in all these different studies. Uh, but if you're th one of these people that thinks that uh, uh, Jesus didn't drink real wine and he didn't make real alcoholic wine at the at the wedding feast, then uh, this this example of the wineskin should prove prove that uh, it's real wine. All right, I'll go on. If you want, want to say anything about that, go ahead before I move on. Uh, very well said, Brother Luke. Uh, I just love it when you tie it into the gospel. I mean, we can tie everything into the gospel. We really can. Okay, back to you. I thought, I mean, yeah, I definitely agree with what Eric just said, but... um. You know, I never really known too much about wineskins, so I definitely like that. You know, knowing you know why they would burst, you know, due to the gases. So that's a very you know interesting source of knowledge, and it definitely you know, you know, it makes it you know, it's very important that you should not be you know mixing doctrine when you should just be simply teaching you know the one true doctrine you know that Jesus gave us. And but instead of trying to mix it, you know, throw in the laws and you know and all that other type of stuff that happens, like lordship. Okay, um, I did uh, think of that, and it's interesting, Brother Eric, as, as I re originally read about the wineskin, uh, you and I had the same thought that, that we reflected on uh, Jesus' comment about wineskin too, so I guess it was worthwhile to re-explain that again. Uh, let me see now, uh, okay, we finished this chapter here. Now we're going to get to the good part, <laughs> I guess. Uh, we're going to go to the next chapter. I'll read it in the KJV, and then I'll, we'll probably have to look at it in the Amplified to understand it better. I'll read it all the way through the, in the KJV, and then again I'll ask you to kind of give me a title for the chapter, and we'll see how your title matches up with the Amplified version, the title they selected for the chapter. Does that sound good? Uh, did Stephen give the last uh, chapter a title? Hmm. I guess. Well, I at that time, I guess I called it. Um, I called it. You know, Ellie Hughes. I guess like I said, it was originally his rage. But if I were to give it a title right now, I would you know say that the title he said it was is that he rebuked Job. But I would say that he rebuked the three men for the title because I feel like that makes more sense. But. You know what, Wolf? Let, I'll I'll give it this one a name after we've read it. Yeah. Well, that was my conclusion too. That uh, the title should be Elihu. If we're gonna, it, we know there's no real title because the titles are just inserted by translators and publishers and stuff. But uh, if if I was gonna give it the chapter title, I'd say Elihu rebukes the three friends. Uh, 
Okay, let me go on now and read chapter uh, 33 in the KJV. Uh, Wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. Behold, now I have opened my mouth, my tongue hath spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall uh, my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy words, saying, I am clean without transgression, I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, he findeth occasions against me, he counteth me for his enemy, he putteth my feet in the stocks, he marketh all my paths. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumbering upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit, and his life from perishing by the sword. He chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread, and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I will speak. If thou hast anything to say, answer me, speak, for I desire to justify thee. If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. Well, I would label that uh, Elihu is just getting started. Okay. I mean, yeah, it seems like it's more of just, I guess, the warm-up or whatever here. Because I know the first part of it, he seems like he's just, like, just a continuation of, you know, what we were looking at in, you know, Chapter 32. Kind of like, you know, his prep-up speech where, you know, I'm going to, you know, open my mouth and let my words, you know, of a rightness, you know, of my heart and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. You know, that's how it's starting, like, giving, like... Just saying that he's about to, but then, hold on, there was something in here, where was it? I, maybe there was a slight bit of rebuke in here, but, yeah, it feels like it's just like the start to his speech right here, pretty much. Okay, um... The, the title that the Amplified selected for this chapter 
is Elihu claims to speak for God. So when we go through this more slowly, we'll, we'll see if that title really fits. But from my, my impression after reading the KJV is that I, I think that is correct in that, first of all, Elihu, I think, is proving his original claim that I've sit, sat here patiently, respectfully. I didn't say a word. I listened very carefully to everything that has been said. All your charges against Job, all Job's answers back to you, I've listened. I haven't said a word. He's proved that because he gave a brief recount of what has actually happened. That uh, the, 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 the friends were accused, accusing him, and, and Job was claiming that he's righteous and innocent, and that he doesn't uh, uh, understand why uh, uh, these things are happening, and God is doing this to him. And questioning God, and so he's give a brief recount of what, what happened, very briefly. He'll, I'm sure he's going to go through the whole thing more thoroughly, but he's saying that uh, as he goes through that, he's kind of speaking for God. He's giving God's side of it, God's position on these things. Hey, look, as I'm speaking for God, and, and, and God says, I don't want anybody to, you know, to go to hell. I, I'd like for you to, you know, uh, repent and, you know, just tell me, Tell me, uh, you know, I, uh, you want forgiveness, and I'll forgive you, and you'll be, be restored. But uh, uh, so he's, he's kind of, he thinks he's speaking for God. He's saying what God wants, wants uh, Job to know. Uh, I'll go through it now in the Amplified, but before I do, you can answer that if you want. Yes. Uh, you know what I think? Uh I can't remember what I think. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I have to agree. Like, he seems like he is justifying himself a lot, but before we go on, it looks like we have a fourth person that just joined us here in this chat. Uh, uh, just, just ignore them. It's okay. Uh, now, let me go on. Uh, now in the Amplified... Chapter 33, verse 1. However, Job, please listen to my words and pay attention to everything I say. Behold, I have opened my mouth to begin my speech. My tongue is in my mouth. My tongue in my mouth is going to speak. My words will express the uprightness of my heart, and my lips will speak what they know with utter sincerity. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life, which inspires me. Answer me if you can. Set yourselves before me. Take your stand. Behold, I belong to God like you. I too was formed out of the clay. Behold, I will not make you afraid or terrified of me, for I am only mortal and not God. Nor should any pressure from me weigh heavily upon you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your word saying, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. Okay, I'll stop there after verse 9. Well, happy Hanukkah. Oh, what happened to Nasser? Oh, he left. Okay, uh, let's pray for Nasser that uh, we can get the gospel to his people before it's too late because uh, we know that uh, the earth will open her mouth and swallow up the flood. Oh, hi, Nasser. How you doing? Uh, anyways, uh, we were just going to tell you today's thunder real quick before you left again. Which is, uh, what is today? Uh, Saturday, Sunday. Confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe God raised him from the dead and be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9. Okay, uh, that was just a little commercial break. Back to you. All right, well, looking at these opening verses, it's again he's 
it's like he's starting to like justify himself, you know, going into this, saying, you know, now it's his turn to talk, and that he wants it to be with you know the uprightness of his heart, and that he just wants to speak, you know, the truth and knowledge. And of course, he also like one thing he says: the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. You know, God made me. I guess he's trying to take more of a maybe a humble approach here. And yeah, he says that he doesn't want to be, you know, doesn't want to bash him, but just wants to, you know, speak the truth, pretty much. Okay. Uh, to me, the uh, verse nine. I probably should have continued to a little further, but uh, he he says in verse eight, "Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words saying." Uh, so Elihu is saying, "Job, I heard you say this. Your Job, you're claiming that you say I am pure without transgression. I am innocent. And there's no guilt in me. Behold, God finds pretexts against me. He counts me as his enemy." He puts my feet in the stocks to hinder and humiliate me. He suspiciously watches all my paths, you say. So uh, that's through verse 11. Uh, so uh, Elihu is again repeating what has been said by the, the accusers, uh, his three friends, and Job's answer, and Job's answer is, he summed it up right here. He's saying that he's completely innocent, and yet God is still doing is doing all these things to him. And then in verse 12, he says, he says to Job, Job, look, let me answer you. In this you are not right or just, for God is greater and far superior to man. Why do you complain against him that he does not answer you with all his doings? For God speaks once and even twice, yet no one notices, including you, Job. In a dream, a vision of the night, one may hear God's voice. When deep sleep falls on men while slumbering upon the bed, he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may turn aside, man aside from his conduct and keep him from pride. I'll stop there at verse 17. Well, as much as I like what I hear, uh, I forbid any doctrines to be made from uh, the book of Job. What would you say? Uh, no comment to, I guess, that one right there. I'll let Brother Luke give his opinion on what you just said, and then I'll say something about the verses. Now, go ahead and continue with the, the, your reaction to the verses, please. Okay, well, I mean, looking here, you know, believe, you know, in this, thou art not just, I will answer thee, that God is greater than man. I mean, yeah, I guess that's a little bit of a, uh, it's just a rebuke right here, you know. Why dost thou strive against him, for he giveth not account unto in any of his mothers? For God speaketh once, yea, twice, that, you know, yet man perceiveth not. Now it's talking about, you know, how God may, you know, choose, you know, I guess to talk to some people, but... I guess I'm more focused on like the uh, first couple of views because I guess I'm saying a little bit of a, re of a rebuke right here, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I, do you find any fault in what Elihu has said so far? From everything Elihu said in these two chapters here, is 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 he saying anything that uh, you can find fault in? Mm, not really so far. Wait, what? Uh, anything you've heard a light who say that you can find fault with? Uh, I'll let Brother Eric answer this one. Oh, I'm sorry. I had to go let the dogs out. Uh, go ahead. All right, I'm going to go on. Uh, verse, uh, uh, verse uh, let me see. Verse 18. Uh, he holds back his soul from the pit of destruction 
and his life from passing over into Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead. Man is also disciplined with pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones, so that his life makes him loathe food and his soul loathe even his favorite dishes. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and his bones, which were not seen, now stick out. Then his soul draws near to the pit of destruction, and his life to those who bring death, the destroyers. If there is an angel as a mediator for him, one out of a thousand, to explain to a man what is right for him, that is, how to be in right standing with God, then the angel is gracious to him and says, spare him from going down to the pit of destruction. I have found a ransom, a consideration or reason for redemption and an atonement. Let his flesh be restored and become fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his useful strength. I'll stop there after verse 25. Okay, uh, I think verse 24 uh, could be uh, a picture of, what is that? Oh, the ransom. Uh, that's a picture of God's salvation. Okay, back to you. I like that. You know, I guess I kind of... Um, went over that, but I'm just glad you pointed that out. Yeah, it says, you know, then he is great this unto him, and saith, deliver him down from going into the pit, I have found a ransom. Because, you know, you can draw that, because, you know, Jesus, you know, was the ransom, he paid it all for us, and, you know, and because of that, you know, we have God's grace in it, you know, because of what Jesus did, and of course, you know, he told us to believe in him, to be saved, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's what really, you know, stands out to me, you know, in all of this as of right now. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, everything Elihu has done and said up to this point, uh, I, I can't find any criticism in it. First of all, he demonstrated restraint and respect for his elders. He didn't speak all the time that they were talking. He was just probably hoping and praying that they they would be able to reason with Job, and and he listened back and forth, and he took notes. He listened very carefully. He was able to even repeat back everything that they had said, proving that he really carefully paid attention. And then when he finally decided, he, okay, he he must speak because they the others failed to address the situation with with Job. He decided he's called he's compelled to speak. And then when he started speaking, he said he's recounting again. Job, you claim that you're absolutely righteous, and and you're and you're saying questioning God, why why is God doing these things to me? And uh, but and then he goes on and presents a kind of a, a salvation message. He's talking about you know um, being restored to God and that there is a ransom, and so everything that he's saying, uh, I don't find fault in at this point. Uh, I don't know in the next chapter as he goes on how, how it's going to play out. But so far, Elihu, I don't think I can find any, any fault in anything he said or done. Uh, you can respond to that before I go on and finish here if you want. I agree. I really don't have too much to say about this point. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm in agreement too. Let's go on. Okay, now I'll continue with... Uh, now, in verse 24, if I compare that... Um, look at verse 23 in the KJV. It says, If there be a messenger with him... Now, the word messenger a lot of times is... Uh, translate to angel and, and vice versa. Uh, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among th a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him. So we have grace 
in this verse 24 and we have a ransom in verse 24 so uh, verse 24 is a picture and a shadow of uh, the, the, the grace of God and the ransom of, of Jesus Christ uh, and, and the restoration. He says, his flesh shall be fresher than a child. He shall return to the days of you. See, so you have uh, the, the, the resurrection there that you're, you're, you're restored physically. Um, now, I'll go back to the Amplified. Um, let me see, I want in verse, uh, verse 26. He will pray to God and he shall be favorable to him. So he's saying, talk to God about, about this issue so that he looks at his face with joy for God restores to man his righteousness. That is his right standing with God. That's right standing is righteousness. That's your salvation. And uh, he sings out to other men. This is verse 27. He sings out to other men. I have sinned and perverted that which was right and it was not proper for me. I don't know who's saying that. Uh, God has redeemed my life from going to the pit. Oh, okay, uh, this would be the the man that's repented, that's that's now uh, restored. He sings out. That's like what you do when you can't wait to tell other people about your salvation. You sing out and say, "I sinned, and for, I was perverted, but God's God's uh, restored me." He's a God in verse 28. God has redeemed my life from going to the pit of destruction, and my life shall see light. So we have, uh, you know. The prayer, that this, the calling on on the name of the Lord, and and then the uh, the uh, forgiveness, the re redemption, and uh, then verse 29, Elihu comments, "Behold, God does all, all these things twice, yes, three times with a man, to bring his life back from the pit of destruction, that he may be enlightened with the light of the living." Then he says, finally, verse 31. Pay attention, Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, you have nothing to say. Uh, if not, and you have nothing to say, listen to me. Keep silent and I will teach you wisdom. So, uh, all right, you go first. I respond to that. I find that, that very interesting. Oh, yes. Uh, you covered that thing very well, as usual. Uh, you didn't leave one stone unturned. Okay, back to you. Well, I mean, the end, obviously, he's, you know, just telling, you know, to listen, unless you have an answer for me, obviously. But, you know, just looking at, I guess I like looking, the verses that stand out to me is, you know, Praying to God, and he'll be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy and render unto him righteousness. And then skipping to verse, you know, 28, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and, you know, he and his life shall see the light. You know, those just really stand out to me, again, like how verse 20, you know, 4 did. You know, it's talking about being, you know, delivered from, you know, death to life, you know, in this type of, you know, situation here. I mean, well, that's how the gospel goes. And, well, speaking of that, you know, now that we've gotten through, you know, verse 33 now, and we've hit, a, and we've got about seven minutes left in the broadcast. Oh, I know it's not my job, I guess, to really say this, but it's probably about that time. Well, first, you know, uh, let, me ask, uh, let me ask each one of you to, to take a, a minute or two and sum up your thoughts about the chapter as a whole. Go ahead. All right. Brother. I really like Elihu, and I hope that uh, what he says to Job uh, is uh, done uh, with love and nothing uh, in condemnation. Okay, back to you. All right. Well, yep. Like he's again, he's trying to show that he's trying to you know give off his you know opinion. As you know, given to him, you know, by God, he's trying to show that this message is coming from God, and that it's not just some biased message, and that he's not just doing it, to, you know, to bash him, that but just trying to, you know, you know, explain, you know, what God has for him. And of course, looking at verses 24, you know, 27 and 20—I mean, sorry, 24, 26, and 
it it just reminds me a lot of the gospel in that situation. All right, so I guess you know unless Brother Luke wants to, I guess I can lead into that. All right, let me um, tell say first that uh, my thoughts on the whole chapter. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember since it's been a long time since I've read Job, and I've never I've read Job uh, several times over the years, but I've never attempted to study it as we are now, or really analyzing it this so carefully. So I really can't tell you what's going to happen in the next chapter. I'm not looking ahead and preparing for these studies and kind of learning learning as we go. So I don't know what Elihu is going to say in the next chapter. But I will say in these two chapters tonight, Elihu, uh, I don't find any fault in him except maybe his final statement when he said, he says, uh, okay, if you're not going to speak, he says, if not, and you have nothing to say, listen to me, keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Um, we, t we had talked in the past about how good Job was, and God selected Job because apparently Job is the best that God could offer Satan as as a as a testament to uh, you know a good man who loved really loves God. So and, and then as we learn more about Job's life and his prominence and his position and 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 also the the good things he's done. Not only did he did he uh, not do bad things. But he did a lot of good things. He even had good thoughts. Didn't even have hateful thoughts, according to Job, at least. Okay, uh, he he pleaded his case as pretty much completely innocent and righteous, and so we didn't have any reason to not believe that. But the only thing that possibly bothers me up to this point is that we know that no one is perfect except Jesus. So Job obviously had to have some faults. He even did admit in an earlier chapter that he had sin and, and God's forgiven his sin because of his faith and that he put God put all of Job's sins inside a bag and then sewed it shut. So we know that Job doesn't believe he's perfect, but he's arguing about presenting his case about uh, how good he is and he doesn't deserve this uh, punishment from God. He thinks it's a punishment from God, but it's not. But it does give me the impression that Job is kind of maybe prideful and, and, and uh, self-righteous. Uh, and then I also see this also in young Elihu. You know, his final statement is, he shut up and listen to me, I'll teach you wisdom. Uh, so that, uh, that came off as a condescending and arrogant for the young man to, to say it. He said he was going to speak kindly and with re respect, but that wasn't really a very respectful thing to say, even though he's finally fed up. He's fed up of listening to uh, all the charges against Job, all Job's answers, and then he presents what he believes is God's position. Elihu thinks he's speaking for God. Job, this is this is how God sees it. And, and, and really, everything he says is true. I don't find any fault in it, but I, it just seems that Elihu got... A little bit arrogant in his final verse there. Uh, now, so we finish these chapters, and as is our custom, uh, before we finish every broadcast, we do not want to neglect the most important uh, part of the whole Bible, and, and that is the gospel. And the, the word gospel is a Greek word that means good news, and Brother Stephen is anxious to tell you about it, I'm sure. I'll let him uh, tell, tell you, but we want to tell you uh, that the Bible has good news for you, and the good news is that uh, salvation, heaven, is offered to you as a free gift. Now, if that's a foreign idea to you, then I'm not surprised, because most people think you don't go to heaven because God gives you the gift of eternal life. They, most people think you go to heaven because you've worked for it and earned it through and, 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 and you deserve it. Heaven's a reward for being a good person. So you're going to find out now from Brother Stephen that um, that's not the case, that, that salvation is a free gift that's offered to you now. If you want it, we're going to tell you how to receive it.
Go ahead, Brother Stephen. All right, here we go. Well, I guess before, you know, well, as I jump into it, just relating it to this chapter, let's look at verse, you know, 24 again. Then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver, hith, deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Well, we do have a ransom. You know, that paid for all of our sins, you know, making it a free gift. And that ransom is Jesus. You know, Jesus was, you know, well, is God in the flesh, because as Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He is God in the flesh who, being the God of this entire universe, you know, throughout all of the galaxies, came to our planet in the form of a man, put on skin, was fully man, fully God. He fulfilled the law. He was righteous. He was sinless. He was perfect. He pleased God. He did everything God told him to do, yet at the same time being one with the Father, as mentioned in the book of John. And you know, not only did he do that, but he also, as he said, showed true love by laying down his life for the sheep. You know, as he predicted what happened, he died on the cross. He was buried. And then he rose again three days later also, as he said, he, as he said, destroy the temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Well, he did that by rising again, also proving who he was and saying what he, that everything that he had said was true, you know, as well as his miracles. But the most important thing is he died for you. You know, he died so that you can have remission of your sins. He, you know, also said that, you know, to receive this gift, all you have to do is believe, as it said in John uh, 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You know, and that he that believeth on me, you know, is not condemned, but he that does not, be oh, sorry, let me repeat in case I stumbled on there. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that is does not believe is already condemned. You see that, like, salvation is a gift. You know, and the only and the only to accept the gift, all you have to do is believe in Jesus for that gift, because you know He paid it all. It's a gift. You know, as John three sixteen says, "For God so loved the world that He that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life." And that goes for everyone who believes in him. And also salvation. And the best part about it is once you have it, you'll never lose it. Because, you know, Jesus, you know, the way Jesus said it, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life, that means it's yours. You have it, and you're never going to lose it. As you know, it's just an amazing gift considering, you know, that God would be willing to just go that far for us. But it's just very simple. Just believe on Jesus and be saved. You know, as the, the disciples responded when asked that, Sirs, what, what must I be do to, to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You know, he paid it all. And there's no work, no religion, or anything that can get you into heaven or even give you a proper relationship with God other than Jesus. As he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. There's no other way to come but by him. And to come to him, you have to believe. And, you know... A lot of people like to mix in works with that, though, to say that you have to then be obedient and you have to do X, X, and X and do all these works. You have to be baptized and all this stuff to be worthy of Jesus' gift. But at the same time, that negates the, the gift part of it because then that's turning it into works and saying that you have to earn it and turning it into a wage. When at the same time, the Bible says it's clearly a gift and that the work of God is to believe on the one who he has sent and that you'll pass from death unto life, and that you will be made, you know, a new creation. You know, it's just, you know, it's a beyond amazing, and it's not just an amazing story, because it's just, it's the truth. You know, Jesus loves you, he paid it all for you, and, you know, he wants to give you everlasting life. All you have to do is just believe on him. Believe on the Savior, and you will be saved, and saved forever. And that's about all I have. It's a very simple message. All right, I'm, I'm, I'll say one brief thing and then let Brother Eric get the last word on this. Uh, I, I absolutely agree and endorse everything that uh, Brother Stephen just said. Uh, now, Jesus said, uh, 
that he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And when Jesus made that claim, it was outlandish because he said that he's the way to heaven. He's the truth you must believe. He's the life everlasting you must receive. And he says you can't get into heaven any other way except through him. So you have to either think that he was either a crazy person or he was a liar or you can believe his words, believe that it's true. Jesus is the only way. I need to put my faith in him. I need to trust him to get me into heaven. There is another way that you can try to get to heaven. So if you think that there's another way, that's through your own efforts, through your own personal merit. You can try it if you want, uh, but the Bible says that is doomed to failure because it says, Here's perfection that we need to meet to go to heaven. And he, here's man trying to achieve it. And it says, we all fall short of the glory of God. So make a choice. Do you want to try to get on into heaven through your own efforts? Good luck. Good luck. Or you could say, I accept defeat. I, I know it's impossible. I, I'm going to trust Jesus and receive this free gift of heaven from him. I hope you choose Jesus. Trust him. Uh, Brother, Brother Eric, uh, now after someone does put their faith in Jesus, uh, what are, are you going to suggest that they say and do? Well, Brother Luke, uh, usually God brings them to me, and uh, God gave me a prayer to say to them. Uh, if he doesn't bring them to me, then i got to run out there, and i got to find them, and i got to uh, tell them what... Uh, the best way to thank God for his great gift of salvation would be to just say a simple prayer like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give me eternal life with you in paradise forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, according to scriptures, all that God requires of us is to go and love one another. Okay, back to you. Okay, guys, uh, that was very interesting. I'm looking forward to this next chapter, hearing more about Elihu in, in Job's uh, conversation. Can't wait for that. Um, uh, if you're watching this live, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, join us nightly, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.